Good morning. It is great to uh, great to be with y'all. Um, I will give you just a couple of things if, to pray for, just very selfishly, right at the beginning, uh, for RUF. Um, it <laughs> um, it's not news to you that 2020 has been really weird. That 2021 has been also weird, and uh, it's certainly true for our campus ministers. Um, I oversee 16 campuses. Uh, RUF campuses, it's 15 in Texas and one in New Mexico. And um, in that, uh, we have seen our campus ministries uh, have to basically start over. Uh, they're rethinking every aspect of ministry. Um, they're um, figuring out how to meet on campus under tents with heaters six feet apart with masks and uh, doing Zoom large groups and uh, small group Bible studies and all sorts of just um, stuff that was never, uh, never on our radar uh, before March of last year. And so um, if you could just pray, um, there is a weariness that I'm sure you feel um, that our campus ministers feel. Um, starting another semester uh, this way is hard. If you're a college student here, you know that feeling of, of walking onto this barren landscape that is your campus because everything's on Zoom. And um, not really being able to hang out with anyone and having to, um, it's almost twice the work to do anything uh, to think about not meeting with a student. It's, it's not just meeting with them and pastoring them. It's all of the COVID regulations and restrictions, and it's all of the complications, university policies, and all sorts of stuff. And so if you would just pray for our campus ministers, pray for me. Uh, the large part of my job is pastoring our campus ministers and our staff and their families. And uh, my nor in the normal course of my job, I visit every campus once a semester. And so I live in Fort Worth, my wife and four kids, and uh, I travel. Uh, once a week, usually I'm gone for a night uh, to visit a campus, see their campus ministry, go to large group, um, to spend time with the campus minister and his wife, with our interns and staff. And um, I, I am able to do that a little bit, uh, travel-wise. Um, I drive most everywhere and try to be really careful. But um, pray for me as I try to pastor our staff and encourage them um, as we work on um, just trusting in Jesus in this time. Um, I, I could use your prayers for that. Uh, as I coach, do a lot of ministry coaching, and then working with um, presbyteries and churches to hire new staff. Um, we've had a, a good bit of turnover in our area, just guys taking other calls or going to plant churches, that kind of thing. And so I've done a, a good bit of work trying to hire uh, campus ministers and campus staff, and uh, you can pray that in the midst of COVID that we would make good and wise decisions in our hiring and that we would put great pastors and staff on campus to love college students. It's a privilege to be able to do this work, to, to raise support to be able to do that. If you guys have questions, if you want information, if you have a, a friend or a family member, someone going to college, and you want to get them connected to RUF, I'd be happy to connect after the service. Would love to give my information to Derek, who can help you. I'd love to be a resource in anything and everything college ministry related. Um, so it is a privilege to be here to bring God's word uh, to you this morning. Um, it's, this message is for me, <laughs> honestly. Um, as I work on it, I, I feel like I am particularly prone to complaining, uh, to frustrations, to disappointment, to uh, just being done with 2020 and, and now done already at the end of January with 2021. Um, that is not my normal disposition, but that is my COVID disposition. And I feel like um, I, I needed to be reminded of God's um, kindness and the impact that gratitude and thankfulness have on my own heart. And so um, I am glad that you get to listen in, but I am preaching this to me um, because it's something that I struggle with. And maybe, maybe it will help you too. I think in a, in a year that feels like 10 years, um, it is especially important for us to think about 
the role of thankfulness? Where does it come from? Uh, how, do we, how do we practice it? Um, what would that look like in our own lives um, is really important for us. We do this thing at our church back home in, in Fort Worth where we give the kids a couple things to listen out for. So kids, I want to give you just a couple things. Uh, and that's grown-up kids too, if you need a little uh, something to hang your uh, hat on as we walk through this passage together. Um, we're going to talk about two big words, the indicative and the imperative. Okay, that's going to be important. Listen out for those. We're going to talk about fish oil at some point in the sermon, and then um, an Andrew Peterson concert. So um, if that helps you kind of know what to listen out for, um, we are going to talk about those things in addition to thinking about uh, Thanksgiving um, and giving gratitude to God. So let's turn, uh, if you have a Bible or a device, if you would turn to Colossians chapter 3, um, we are going to read this passage. Um, this is the second half of Colossians chapter 3, and it talks about putting on the new self and what it looks like to live as a Christian. And I want you to hear um, how thankfulness is talked about in this passage as I read it. So it's printed up here behind me, uh, and if you'll follow along. This is God's Word, and He gives it to us because He's good and He loves us. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for your word, that it is truth and life to us. We pray that you would teach us now, that you would work by your spirit, soften our hearts as we hear the, the truths of the gospel, remind us of all that you have done for us, help us to be thankful. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Ann, Va Ann Voskamp uh, is a Christian author. Um, and she wrote a book called A Thousand Gifts, and it's excellent. Uh, a lot, it talks a lot about Thanksgiving. And she says in that book, The practice of giving thanks, Eucharisteo, this is the way we practice the presence of God. Stay present to his presence, and it is always a practice of the eyes. We don't have to change what we see, only the way we see. As we think about why thankfulness can be so difficult for us, I think she hits it on the head. Often we look at what we see and we use that as the lens to interpret what's going on around us. We see another work from home season. We see kids struggling with online school. Uh, we see financial uh, crisis or um, concerns. We see relational stress from everyone being at home all the time. We, we feel the loneliness of not being in community. All of these things, and it can cause us to get quickly discouraged. And Ann Voskamp encourages us not to change what we see, but how we see it. To see more often and more clearly what it is that God has done for us. And so this morning, we're going to look at the root of thankfulness uh, thanksgiving as the, the fruit of faith, and then the practice of thanksgiving. So where does our thankfulness come from? What is the root of thank thankfulness? Well, I mentioned those two big words, the indicative and the imperative. Uh, just real quick, those definitions. The indicative is what's true of us, statements that are true about us. The imperative are the things that we should do. And there's a formula in the Bible. You'll find this pattern all over the place in the scriptures. And it's this, the indicative 
always precedes the imperative, all right? The Bible is full of all sorts of commands, right? Uh, the Ten Commandments, it's full of love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. There are all of these things that we are to do. We're to put on compassionate hearts, put on kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. But those things are never naked commands. We never just get a command, and we never get this formula in the Bible. If you do these things, then God will love you. If you do these things, then you'll be adopted. The imperative never precedes the indicative, right? Do you see that? We never get a command by itself, and we never get the command preceding God's love. There's never a condition in that way. What happens in the Bible, the pattern in the Bible, is that the indicative always precedes the imperative. God is going to say, you are my people. I have brought you out of slavery, out of the house of Egypt. I have saved you. I have redeemed you. Now obey. Follow the Ten Commandments. Uh, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians is a good example of this if you want to go look at it. Chapters 1 through 3 in Ephesians are all indicative telling you all of the blessings that we have received because of Christ's work on our behalf. And Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 are the imperatives. Because 1 through 3 is true, now go do 4 through 6. You see that? Colossians is the same way. If you look in these four chapters, you'll see very similar uh, indicative preceding the imperative. Because of all of the things that Christ has done for us, now put on the new self. Right? It's always rooted in who Christ is and what he has done for us, what is true of us. If you look back in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, it says this, The Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Verses, chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, that's who we once were, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, maybe this is a familiar passage to you. It says this, In him you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. God has worked through his son to save you, to save me. He has redeemed us. He has made us alive, even though we were dead in our trespasses. He has forgiven us, canceling the, the record of debt against us. In our passage this morning, uh, in chapter 3, verse 4, Paul says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. It's not just what Christ has done, but, but what Christ will do. We will be with him when he returns, and we can be as certain of that as we are of his first coming. Chapter Chapter 3, verse 12 says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. God has worked in Christ to make you, if you have believed and trusted in him, holy and beloved. Now, we don't feel that very often, if you're anything like me. We can major in our sin instead of majoring in uh, the new self. But we are, because of Christ's work on our behalf, we are holy and beloved. And beloved, right now, we are holy and beloved of God. Verse 13, the Lord has forgiven us. We have all of these reminders, all of these statements that are true of us. And what happens as we see them, 
often and regularly, as we see these statements, as we are reminded of who we are in Christ, it changes how we see our circumstances. It produces in us gratitude. We can be thankful even in the midst of hard things because Christ has accomplished all of these things for us. As we think about the root of thankfulness, where it comes from, it comes from Christ's work on our behalf. We also want to think about thanksgiving as the fruit of faith. As we put our trust in Christ, as we recognize that He is our Lord and Savior, that He's accomplished these things for us, the new self that Christ has given us produces fruit. Right? Not just the Galatians 5, fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But it also produces other fruits of faith, right? In our passage, verse 12, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. It gives us the ability to bear with one another, to forgive one another as the Lord has forgiven us. To put on love. To let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. And then we get in this section, in verses 15, 16, and 17, this reminder to be thankful. Now, if you've been around Christianity, if you've been around the Bible for a while, one of the clues to what's important is repetition, right? If you hear something... Uh, In the Bible, and it's repeated over and over again, it's pretty important, right? Holy, 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 right? In, In our passage, we have three verses, and in three verses, being thankful is mentioned three times. That's a pretty high frequency, and it should catch our attention. Of all of these things that we're to put on, we're to put on thankfulness, to be thankful, to give thanks in all that we do, whether in word or deed. It's a reminder to us that the fruit of faith should produce in us thankfulness. As we have been given a new heart by Christ, as we walk in the newness of that, one of the things that should come is an overwhelming gratitude. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Uh, If you're anything like me or anything like the college students, I I worked as the campus minister at Virginia Tech for eight years uh, before coming to this job uh, 18 months ago. Um, Anything like them, what they want, and we've had a lot of students, thankfully, by God's grace, come to know Jesus, either for the first time or in a new way, uh, in RUF at Virginia Tech. It was beautiful, it was really fun, and I would often sit down with fairly new Christians or new new to Christ again, right, if they maybe grew up in the church but it became new to them uh, in college, I would sit down with them and they'd say, why why do I still do this, right? I used to get so angry with my roommate, now I'm a Christian and you said, right, it often happens like that, and you said if I was in Christ that I would be kinder, (laughs) Why, why am I still mad at them? And it, it is in those moments, right? Uh, and I could say that about me and my, my parenting, right? Uh, I, I trust Jesus. I read my Bible. I try to pray. And I still am like hairpin trigger angry sometimes. Uh, when my kids are interrupting my comfort or my, you know, my rest, um, it is not often, right, that I am quick to be patient with them. I can be so angry. And I still say to Jesus, like, I prayed before I went to bed that I would not be frustrated when my seven-year-old came into my room again at three in the morning. All right? And he he came in again, and I got frustrated. And I prayed the night before, right? Maybe you're familiar with that. On a big scale, it can be easy to get frustrated that we may not be seeing a ton of progress. There may not be a lot of fruit in our sanctification that we could see. As we grow in Christ, often our hearts want big wholesale changes and we want them right away. And that's not often how things work. Uh, There's a great uh, collection of Puritan prayers called the Valley of Vision. If you've never seen it, it's beautiful. I use it quite a bit when I struggle to know how to pray, to read those prayers has become really helpful. And the first prayer in the Valley of Vision talks about the paradox of faith, that the way up is actually the way down. 
right? That the way to glory is actually the way of humility. And often, when I would sit across the table uh, having coffee with students, the conversation would go like this. You said I would be kinder, and I would say, it's hard to be kind. But do you feel, the re- even the recognition that you aren't kind is a step in the right direction, right? Even that you are frustrated by your sin is, is a glimpse. It's a small work of the Spirit in your life. And you need to be thankful even for those small moments. And Voskamp again says this, The whole of life, even the hard things, is made up of the minute parts. And if I miss the infinitesimals, I'll miss the whole. These are the new language lessons and I live them out. There is a way to live the big of giving thanks in all things. It is this, to give thanks in this one small thing. The moments will add up. I think that that's so helpful. That in this progress, in this season of life that has been so challenging, we need to focus in on the infinitesimals. Where are the smallest moments that we have seen Christ at work in our hearts? And it might simply be a quicker frustration that we uh, lusted again, that we looked at porn, that we got angry with our spouse, that we got frustrated with our children, that we, whatever it is, it might even be in that smallest of moments where we recognize the grace of Jesus coming in to our lives. That the new self is conquering the old self. As we rest in those those small fruits of faith, it is going to engender thankfulness in us. It's going to grow a spirit of gratitude in us. Remembering with thanks causes us to trust, to really believe that what Jesus says is true. And that helps us to be thankful. There is this cycle. If you are familiar with Psalm 136, you hear this this refrain, give thanks to the Lord, his steadfast love endures forever. And then you'll hear a line about God delivering his people from Egypt. Give thanks to the Lord, his steadfast love endures forever. And then you'll hear another line of God's deliverance. Give thanks to the Lord, his steadfast love endures forever. There, There is a practice of seeing God's faithfulness giving thanks for that, and that thankfulness causes us to remember even more deeply what Christ has done for us, and that, in, that grows more thankfulness, and then that thankfulness causes us to dwell, right? This is what abiding looks like. If you've ever wondered what it looks like to abide in Christ, I tell my students it's often remembering, Uh, Ellie Holcomb is a Nashville singer-songwriter, and she wrote a children's book. She's written a couple of them, and one of them is called Don't Forget to Remember. And I think it's so helpful to think about that concept, that the, the more that we remember, the more that we dwell and abide in Christ, that thankfulness will grow. We'll be able to face our circumstances in a new way because of his work in us. A couple of ideas on the practice of thanksgiving. How can we be more thankful? We've just come out of the Christmas holiday season, and there are uh, triggers, traditions, rhythms for all of us. Maybe it's a a certain smell, right? Uh, We have some traditions in our family. Uh, Amy's mom uh, makes um, bear claws, these like intricate pastries um, that are awesome, and and to smell that is a trigger for me that it's Christmas, and it it, it brings thankfulness. Um, The Andrew Peterson, Behold the Lamb of God concert, maybe some of you are familiar with Andrew Peterson. He's another Nashville singer-songwriter 20-some years ago. He made a Christmas album called Behold the Lamb of God, and it is basically the Jesus Storybook Bible set to music. Like, if you know the Jesus Storybook Bible, Um, It's that good. It starts in the Old Testament and kind of works all the way through, and they do a Christmas concert tour. They end up um, doing a couple of performances at the Ryman in Nashville, and they go all over the country. They play this music. They, They play the album from start to finish. And when we start playing that music or watch the concert from afar or have the opportunity to go see it, it is a trigger for me that Christmas is here. The thankfulness and all of those things that come with just the trigger of that tradition, of that rhythm, 
it changes me and really changes my mood and uh, interaction with my family and um, just it's an opportunity for Christmas to really start in our house. And I think having some traditions or rhythms like that that we do in the holiday season are really helpful as it comes in terms of thanksgiving. We can root our thankfulness in certain rhythms or traditions. The, the church for centuries has called this like a rule of life or spiritual formation. That there are certain things, maybe first thing when we wake up in the morning, right, we have the, the the post-it note, the index card attached to the mirror. So as we're brushing our teeth, we're reading just a short scripture that brings to mind what Christ has done for us and it causes us to be thankful. Maybe uh, it's a journal that you've started keeping uh, and you're writing down the things that are thankf- you're thankful for. Um, using your phone to take pictures of things that you're thankful for. A beautiful sunset, uh, maybe a good grade that one of your kids have brought home. Some, something, just taking a picture and keeping an album on your phone of all of the things that you're thankful for can be an opportunity for you to root your thankfulness in these traditions and rhythms. Uh, a lot of writers about thankfulness talk about hurry, uh, hurry as a form of ingratitude. And so I want you to think about as you try to practice thanksgiving, as you remember all that Christ has done for us, it is harder to do that uh, when you are running 100 miles an hour. There is something that needs to change in terms of our busyness in order for us to be more thankful. As we hurry from one thing to the next, as we juggle kids, as we juggle job responsibilities, as we manage in COVID times, all of these things, there have to be moments of pause for us to be thankful. We have to slow down and rest in Christ to see what he has done for us and be able to be thankful. Maybe it's, uh, this was a practice that we worked on um, uh, again, when I wasn't working from home, right? We drive. I drive into the drive into the driveway, turn the car off, and just sit for a second. Rem- remind myself that my kids are a gift from Jesus, that I love them, that I need to be present with them before I walk into the house. That it's not about me getting home from work and having my time when I get home. But it's about me coming in and recognizing the gifts that God has given me and to be thankful. Where is that moment, that moment of pause for you? Maybe it's a walk. You can take the dog out and it could be a moment of pause and reflection to see God's kindness to you. Lastly, I think finding thankfulness in the hard things can be really helpful um, Brian Habig is a pastor in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, and uh, he's the one who talked about uh, gratitude being like fish oil, right? Fish oil is this thing that's good for everything, right? <laughs> right? If you want uh, better skin, take fish oil. And if you want uh, to reduce your joint pain, take fish oil, right? If you want better cardiovascular health, you take fish oil, right? It's kind of, it sort of does everything. Maybe nobody really knows what it does, but they say it does everything, right? And so that's that's the goal. You take fish oil, and, and gratitude in the Christian life is sort of like that. If things are really good, be grateful, If things are really hard, be grateful. If you need help in your relationship, in your marriage, be grateful. If you need help in disciplining and loving your children, be grateful. If you need help at work, be grateful. He he prays this way. I love this prayer. He says this, Lord, thank you for my friends. Thank you for my health. Thank you for everything. Thank you for my physical pains. They remind me that I'm not home. Thank you for when I feel overwhelmed and I'm trending toward despair. Not that despair is good, but thank you that that's when I feel how much I really need you. Thank you for my enemies, because they're not right about everything, but they're probably on to something that I don't really want to see. And thank you for my dog, because they glorify you. Thank you for everything. And, and I love that. And I think it captures, in a good way, the idea of being grateful for the good things, for the hard things, for the beautiful gifts of God in our lives, even our dogs. 
Colossians 3, chapter 1 says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And I'll add to that, set your eyes on things that are above. As we see and remember God's kindness to us in Jesus, we will grow in our gratitude. And as we grow in our gratitude, we will grow in our trust and our love for God and our love for our neighbor. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for your love for us. We have so much to be thankful for. Would you remind us often of all of those gifts? Help us to be thankful. And would you, by your kindness, uh, continue to, to show us the things that we have to be thankful for. Remind us of your great love for us in Jesus, we pray. Amen.